Chapter Seven of *The Man Who Ended War*. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. *The Man Who Ended War* by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter Seven. The wreck of the wave measuring machine once installed in the laboratory, every energy was bent towards putting it into perfect working condition. A maddening task it was. Thrown hither and thither in the corners of warehouses, the missing parts and waving broken wires of the apparatus, as it first stood on the laboratory table, gave but little promise of final renovation. But the possibilities which it held entranced both Dorothy and Tom. Each day I came up to find them working. Each night they came back to the laboratory for a few more hours' work. The minds of all of us were turning more and more to our one fixed purpose, the discovery of the man who was trying to stop all war. The stir and tremor of the tumultuous world around, eager for news of the dread tragedies, seemed to be but an outside interest, compared with the tremendous possibilities of running down the individual at the bottom of this gigantic undertaking. Gradually, the chaos began to take on form. Cylinders of shining metal rose above the polish of the base. Revolving hemispheres and cones resumed their original forms, or were replaced by reproductions. Broken wires, replaced by new wire, found their connections. Jones was indefatigable. He was forever polishing, adjusting, scraping, and his mild blue eyes behind his big spectacles glowed with enthusiasm as he sat gazing at the wave-measuring machine and working on one of its parts. On the evening of the fourth day I came up to the laboratory about ten o'clock and found Tom making some last adjustments while Dorothy and Jones looked on. "'I think we have it,' said Dorothy as she greeted me. "'This is the last connection. Now that you have it all set up, tell me how it works,' I said." You've been so tied up in the thing that I've hardly heard a word from you in a week. <laughs> Too bad, answered Dorothy, laughing. We'll tell you enough about it to show you what to expect. I leaned over curiously to examine the wave measuring machine. It stood on a round table, ten or twelve feet in diameter, looking not unlike some fortress town, such as rises on the banks of many a river in southern Europe. A belt of broad, shining metal a foot high encircled it, as the gray walls of stone surrounded the town. Within the belt stood polished cones and hemispheres, which rose for a height of some two feet, bringing to mind round towers of fortalice and dwelling within the battlemented walls. Wires, ranged with mathematical preciseness, completed the comparison by their similarity to two streets surmounted by telegraph wires. The surrounding belt seemed solid, but as Jones threw the reflector of a powerful incandescent on it, I could see it was lined with millions of tiny scenes. Tom threw a switch, and to my surprise, the belt began slowly to revolve around the central portion. "'What's that belt for?' I asked. "'That's where the wave of electrical energy enters. It goes into the interior of the machine through one of those tiny slits which you see. Once inside, the wave strikes a magnetic coil about a mirror.' which swings when the energy acts upon it and throws a beam of light down that scale he pointed to the opposite wall there extending from one side to the other of the room some fifty feet in all stretched a scale like a foot rule suddenly grown gigantic its space was covered with divisions a big zero in the middle and numbers running up from zero along into the hundreds of thousands and millions on either side just at the zero point rested a long narrow beam of light you see that beam Tom went on. When the waves come into the machine, they go through, as I explained. The machine stops, and the light goes up or down the scale. The distance that it goes shows how far away the wave started. The slit through which the wave comes shows the exact direction from which it comes, and we can get that easily because the machine stops as the wave goes through. Then, by means of a certain amount of mathematics, we hope to be able to find just where a wave comes from. We can adjust the machine so that it will register anything from a wireless telegraph message through a radium discharge to the enormously powerful waves which the man uses. We have it adjusted now for the waves which the man uses in destroying the battleships. We know something of them from the way in which they charged the reflectoscopes. That's the whole thing. One more thing, I said inquiringly. If the man destroys a battleship, does the machine stop and the beam of light run down the scale? 
Yes, answered Tom. That's just what it does. All right, I said. Now we'll start it up, remarked Tom. Turn off the lights. Uh, throw off the inner insulation, he commanded, turning to Jones, who obediently threw a couple of switches. We were left in partial darkness. On the long scale, on the opposite side of the room, the single line of light rested at the center, illuminating the zero. There was a shaded incandescent in one corner, which threw no light on the black wall where stood the scale, but gave a dim radiance sufficient to reveal the belt of polished metal as it swiftly revolved about the mass within. Dorothy sat near the apparatus. Jones was puttering with something at one end of the scale, and Tom and I sat side by side watching the whole scale. Suddenly the beam swept swiftly far up the scale, fluttered for a moment, and rested on a point. The moving belt stopped with a slight click. "'That's it. There's another battleship gone,' cried Tom, as we all hurried over to the scale. "'Now we can tell just where he is doing his deadly work. Two, three forty, six twenty-four, fourteen o one. he read, scrutinizing with a microscope the scale at the point where the beam rested. "'Here, Jones, turn on the lights. Bring me the logarithm tables, our table of constants, and Denkel's table of constants that we found under the middle cylinder.' jones ran excitedly across the laboratory returning with the needed things tom dorothy and jones each sat down to figure while i watched dorothy's nimble fingers as they flew over the paper filling sheet after sheet with computations what different powers lay in those little hands abstruse calculations vied with bread-making careful manipulations of delicate instruments with the steering wheel of her motor-car last week we had eaten a dinner prepared wholly by her this week she was working out one of the great triumphs of modern science it seemed almost a shame to confine those talents in a single home but yet and the old train of thought started on its ever-recurring cycle suddenly tom threw down his pen beat you that time old girl he said dorothy gave no heed but figured on for a minute more then she too dropped her pen want my figures tom she asked not yet answered tom wait for jones I'll go and get the maps, and we'll work the second step as soon as we have checked these figures. Jones worked laboriously on, and Tom had gone and returned, bearing two huge portfolios before his task was ended. Read off, said Tom, and a whole series of numerals came from Dorothy's lips, at each of which Jones nodded his head. As she ended, she looked inquiringly at Tom. All right, said he. Now, reverse the beam to find the slit. Jones brought a small scale with lights mounted with flexible cords. He placed it across the beam, sighted through it as Tom threw off the lights, and, after a brief manipulation, threw a switch. All turned to gaze at the belt. Through a single slit, an almost geometric line of light shone forth. "'Beautiful! Beautiful!' cried Tom, and Dorothy cried, "'Oh, Jim! Oh, Tom, we've got it!' My name came first to her hour of triumph." I had time to notice that, before the lights went on once more. Tom took a dozen hasty readings and rapidly read them off. Another period of rapid computation followed. Then, one by one, Dorothy leading, they made a swift survey of the maps. More and more anxious grew the trio as they went on. Map followed map, till Dorothy came to a final one, made her last measurement, and sat back in apparently complete bewilderment. Tom, by a different route, reached the same map and drew it from her, shaking his head vehemently and jones laboring heavily along in the rear finally stretched his hand for the same sheet what have you got jones said tom sharply tokyo japan said jones what do you get tokyo confound it said tom dorothy sat back in her chair and began to laugh at his disgusted tone tom you get excited too easily how do you know that he may not be there i don't growled tom but I don't believe he's gone from Brest to Tokyo in ten days, especially when he is to sink a German warship next. But there may be a German warship there, answered Dorothy. There isn't a first-class German battleship in Asiatic waters today, I broke in. I'm following every one, and they've all been called in to home stations within a month on some excuse of trial and mobilization. They've all passed Suez. Tom gave a long whistle. We set the machine for those terrific waves that the man uses. Of course somebody in Tokyo might have them, but it's improbable. Let's start her up again. Once more the lights were lowered. Once more the belt resumed its revolution as we watched. Scarcely a minute passed, and the machine stopped as before with a click. 
the beam fluttered for a moment and stopped apparently in the same place where it started well i'll be hanged said tom as he hurried over to examine it point zero 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 one he read off why that's not outside new york don't figure it said dorothy reverse the beam no sooner said than done and a slit on the left sprang into light tom stood blankly his hands deep in his pockets as he gazed telephone corinna in the physical laboratory up at u c n y said dorothy excitedly ask him what he's doing now tom jumped for the telephone and a rapid-fire volley of calls and questions followed as he hung up the receiver he turned to us despairingly it was corinna he's just been making some radioactive experiments the blame machine registers every strong radioactive wave that's sent out anywhere in the world then all you've got to do is to adjust the apparatus till you get a new adjustment which will register the man's wave isn't it i asked yes snapped tom and it took denkel three years to get that adjustment and there's no data on how he did it the rest was easy compared to this if only we had that lost manuscript jones sat huddled in a dejected heap dorothy's cheery face was downcast i must confess she sighed that i'm afraid the apparatus isn't going to be of any immediate use to us without that manuscript any immediate use sputtered tom the old thing isn't worth a rap it'll be registering every trolley car that goes by next we've done everything we know how to fix it and it may be ten years before we find out what's the trouble if we only had the denkel manuscript yes if we only had denkel's work said dorothy wearily but we haven't there's no use doing anything more tonight we'll go at it again in the morning the next two days brought no result the wave measuring machine would tell where the waves came from but it would do nothing towards separating them day after day the reflectoscopes were watched for the expected sinking of the german ship but without avail change after change was made in the dinkel apparatus in the hope that the next alteration might be the right one and that it might come in time to place the man before the next battleship went down saturday afternoon the last day of the week in which the man was to sink the german battleship we sat as usual in the laboratory the last adjustment had been as unsuccessful as the rest and tom and dorothy sat in deep thought while jones was scraping the insulation from some wire at one side if only we had that manuscript said tom for the thousandth time but failing it let's have another try jones will you bring me that manuscript i mean the old table of wave constants we made up last winter that's it remarked dorothy his mind is so intent on the manuscript that he ordered it instead of soup the other day to that maelstrom of papers his desk jones turned to find the needed table of constants and after watching his efforts for a few minutes tom turned to dorothy find it will you dorothy i imagine it's there dorothy took command as tom and i sat in silence suddenly dorothy's clear voice rang out look look she came rushing across the room to us holding aloft a big brown paper package followed by jones it's here it's here mr jones had it in his desk and forgot to give it to you tom cast one look of scorn on the apologetic jones as he came slowly forward you immortal idiot he began but dorothy put her hand over his mouth never mind dear it's here don't waste time open it and see what it says scarcely five minutes passed when tom cried here it is and read rapidly in german to his assistants we can have it in shape in an hour there's just that one missing part that threw us completely off he ended he looked at his watch five o'clock by london time and some time before twelve if the man does as he said he would the german battleship will be destroyed if it's not gone already we've got to hustle they had worked before eagerly they worked feverishly now even my unskilled labor was called in and i held and scraped polished and hammered to the best of my limited ability six o'clock seven eight nine one by one they passed tom's hour had grown to four and reached almost to five ere the last connection was made he stood back and threw the switch that set the belt in motion as the belt revolved he glanced at the reflectoscope beside him no result there as yet he said reflectively i guess we are safe ten had passed eleven come and gone still we waited 
tom had set his laboratory clock to london time and as the first stroke of twelve struck he rose stretching his arms first time he's missed as he spoke the beam flashed from the zero well down the board fluttered as before and stood still while the belt stopped we glanced at the reflectoscopes their golden ribbons had sprung apart and stood stiffly separate everything was at hand this time not a word was spoken but the three bent to their task figuring with intense rapidity tom and dorothy finished together jones just behind ran his computing rule faster than he had ever done anything before in my presence as they ended tom spoke the harbour of portsmouth england finished dorothy and the other two nodded gravely i sat beside the telephone we had made sure that an operator who knew that a call was coming sat at the branch exchange and without a second's delay i had the office and had told the news i held the wire till the word came back okay nobody has heard of it yet if it's true it's another big beat the real gravity of the situation did not come to me with full force until i read the accounts in the morning papers the first news that appeared of the sinking of his germanic majesty's first-class battleship kaiser charlemagne had come from me the moment my story was received in the office they had cabled their london correspondent in cipher as soon as the other papers saw the story in our special edition they had likewise rushed cables and wireless messages across in consequence a horde of correspondents had descended on portsmouth before morning dawned the night before there had lain in the harbour three german battleships the kaiser charlemagne the flagship standing furthest out in the morning there were but two at first half incredulous but yet fearful from the past the officers of the german and of the english fleets refused to believe the story but the watch on three ships had seen the lights of the german flagship disappear and hasty search had proved the fact of her disappearance by early morning they were forced to the conviction that the kaiser charlemagne had followed the alaska the dreadnought number eight and la patrie number three the cumulative effect of this last blow was tremendous before this the world had been hoping against hope but now sudden unreasoning panic took control up to this time the stock markets of the world had been buoyed up by the support of great capitalists and by the aid of governments but they had been growing steadily weaker and weaker and the opening of the exchange in london and of the bourses on the continent saw stocks tumbling as never before all america knew of the ruin abroad when our stock markets opened here and a panic day unparalleled in our financial history began after a sleepless night one operator remarked to another as they walked up wall street the sinking of battleships is bad enough but how much worse if he should begin to sink merchant vessels the market quivered the next man passed it on how terrible if the man should sink the transatlantic liners carrying gold the market trembled a brokerage house gave forth the tip the man who is stopping all wars declared that he will sink every transatlantic liner carrying gold as he considers gold the sinews of war the market shook to its very foundations the papers heard the lying news and published it in scareheads the market broke utterly and went plunging to utter destruction industrials and railroads dropped sixty to two hundred points in an hour it was one wild scramble which ended only when no one would buy at any price whatsoever the day ended with meetings of ruined men sending delegates to the various governments in a first general appeal for disarmament the morning of the second day after the sinking of the kaiser charlemagne showed practically but three things in the papers the account of the panic the day before futile discussions as to the identity and plans of the man who was trying to stop all war and stories of deputations entreating the governments of the various powers to disarm apparently the last months had raised the numbers of the peace advocates by millions the papers which had given a few columns a year to such propaganda now gave pages daily other factional differences became forgotten the real need for protecting the lives and property of the nation the fancied need of protecting commerce was the theme of every orator at every meeting in one place only were these deputations received with no consideration the german kaiser the war lord bearded by a single man stripped of one of his proudest battleships received all words regarding peace with utter contumely all papers agreed in considering him the chief stumbling block in the way of a universal peace i was running over the morning papers when a card was brought to me it was that of ordway my old washington friend who as private secretary to the secretary of war gave me the message hello malachi you old prophet of evil he remarked with a cheerful grin as he entered 
give me an inside tip on the end of the world will you i'll use it to bear the market my prophecy shop is closed to-day i replied in his own vein what brings you from washington i came only to see you he said seriously the president made me a special agent to get a line on what you were doing the report that came to him from the attorney general the time they put you in jail whetted his curiosity so he sent me up here to see things for myself will you let me see haldane's machine gladly i answered and we started for the laboratory between ourselves remarked ordway as we walked from the car and strictly not for publication there's the deuce to pay with the kaiser he's mad as hops about his ships going down in portsmouth harbour he thinks it's an invidious distinction to have the kaiser charlemagne go down in a foreign port when the other boats have gone down on their own shores he'd declare war on england for sixpence things were strained enough with the commercial rivalry of the last few years but they're at breaking point now ah uh, it would take a mighty small straw to break that uneasy camel's back tom and dorothy were both in the laboratory and they greeted ordway cordially the especial interest centred in the wave measuring apparatus the polished belt was revolving with regular precision and the beam stood fixed at zero i wish you could have been here and seen it work when the kaiser charlemagne went down said dorothy i wish i might answered ordway scarcely were the words out of his mouth when the click and the springing beam sent my heart into my mouth dorothy and tom sprang for paper and their data ordway looked on in amazement what's up orrington he asked what did the thing stop for another ship has gone down i answered but of what nation i know no more than you we waited silently till the computation was ended dorothy looked up with knotted brow i make it portsmouth again do you tom so do i said tom there must be some mistake let's go over the figures again again they obtained the same result and an hour passed before they gave up searching for possible errors what are you going to do about it orrington asked ordway finally i'm not going to do anything it must be a mistake why not telephone your office and see if they've heard anything i did so they heard nothing but promised to telephone me as soon as they did we had sat for a couple of hours talking when the bell rang and i answered it was the office you slipped up this time orrington said the man at the other end a german battleship the kaiserin luisa had just disappeared off portsmouth i passed the word to the eager trio that means war between england and germany cried ordway i believe it does i exclaimed and i'm going to take the first boat for london here's just the chance to run him down he'll be sure to stay in one place now his work will be in the british channel we'll come too cried dorothy her eyes lighting at the prospect of the chase we'll bring along the wave measuring machine and run him down at close quarters won't we tom tom nodded vigorously i'm with you this man has simply obsessed me i can't do any decent work till i've found him End of chapter seven chapter eight of the man who ended war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the man who ended war by hollis godfrey chapter eight a fierce and sudden gust which swelled to greater fury the flood of a howling gale slammed the smoking-room door in my face at the very moment that a quivering throbbing heave from the great screw shook the mighty liner from stem to stern beaten back from the wall as the ship rolled heavily i pitched headlong and went sliding and tumbling across the deck clutching wildly at its edge for the netting of the rail there huddled against the side i gasped until breath came and then painfully traversed the wet and slippery deck on hands and knees with a sudden effort i caught at the big brass handle turned it and sprang within accompanied by a drenching spray no contrast could have been greater than the sudden change from the wild drift of bitter wind and rain without to the bright warmth and quiet comfort of the smoking-room within the habitues who commonly filled the alcoves and the centre were mainly absent chained to their berths for the gale which had lasted a full two days had swept from the room all but two quartets of bridge players a placid britisher in full dress in the centre who was solacing himself with his invariable evening's occupation of scotch and soda and tom alone in a corner alcove his back against the wall his feet sprawling along the cushions and his pipe firmly clenched between his teeth 
as i pushed my way by the square centre table of the alcove and sat down on the opposite cushions he looked up a thoughtful frown wrinkling his forehead i've been thinking about our next move he began only to break off abruptly what on earth is the matter with you you look as if you'd been shipwrecked this is merely the result i answered of a perilous trip outside the smoking-room door for the purpose of taking a weather observation as a matter of fact you're responsible for it i was driven to the act by your loquacity we came up here at half-past seven and you've spoken exactly three times since each time to give an order i really had to do something desperate to attract your attention you did it said tom decisively hurt in any way oh no i answered slight bruises really nothing of any consequence at all turned by the incident from his preoccupation tom rose stretched himself thoroughly and bent to peer out of the rain-swept porthole this certainly is a nasty night he said as he resumed his original position she is rolling and pitching at a great rate if it does not quit soon this gale will send many a good ship to the bottom we're safe enough here but this weather must be pretty hard on the small boats as tom refilled his pipe i sat musing on the images his words had roused of the strange and sudden plunge of a mighty ship down down to the very depths of the sea of that wonderful world that lies below the waves upon whose sandy floor lie many navies whose gallant ships rest in their last anchorage whose thousands of rugged sailors are buried in their last sleep whose burdened hoarded wealth is kept forever idle by that great miser the deep as i mused i spoke unconsciously i wonder how this storm would seem on the bottom of the sea quiet enough there i presume answered tom following to my surprise my spoken thought you know men who sought for sunken treasure ships have found things quite unmoved after centuries have rolled away save for the covering of sand or silt the boat which reaches the bottom may leave its bones for centuries unchanged my mind travelled a step farther from normal shipwrecks to abnormal ones and then turned swiftly to those catastrophes which were never far from my mind the beginning and in one sense the end of our mission the battleships which disappeared if dorothy's belief is correct and the engines of destruction used by the man affect metal only then i suppose the crews of the alaska and the rest went to the bottom undoubtedly answered tom laconically one by one as in a naval review the alaska the dreadnought number eight la patrie number three the kaiserine louisa and the kaiser charlemagne imaged themselves upon the tablets of my brain and with the last appeared a film of portsmouth harbour where the great engine of war anchored for the last time i straightened up suddenly and leaned across to tom who now sat gazing peacefully at space tom i exclaimed quietly but earnestly i can tell you the next move we'll send down to the bottom of the sea and find out what record remains there of the work done by the man quick as a flash tom was all attention by george he ejaculated lowering his voice an instant later as he saw that his exclamation had startled the bridge players opposite i believe that is the scheme it ought not to take us very long and we might get a bully clue from it how shall we go about it swiftly i unfolded my plan the ideas rushing in upon me as i proceeded we land at southampton anyway and it's only an hour's run down southampton water to portsmouth we won't go up to london at all we'll go straight to portsmouth and put up there then we'll find out just where the kaiser charlemagne or the kaiserine louisa stood and get some divers to go down and report that's a great idea said tom reflectively it resolves itself really into two parts finding out just exactly where one of the german ships stood and getting down to the bottom there it ought not to be so very difficult i wonder nobody has thought of it but if they had i imagine we should have heard of it because the wireless newspaper on board is giving news of that kind pretty well in full i'll tell you one thing though he went on i wish dorothy could have been with us instead of having to wait over a couple of boats to straighten out that boys club business of hers i'd like mighty well to get her opinion same here i remarked forcefully two days later saw us safely through the english customs and rolling along over the little line which runs past old clausentrum relic of the days when rome with bloody hand made peace in britain to portsmouth and its harbour with the isle of wight forming the foreground to the broad blue reaches of the channel 
no greater hum of business could have been found all britain over than in this seaport town jackies hurried to and fro with orders marines marched in companies to the wharves officers in service dress scurried by in motor-cars tommies for once moved swiftly even without a sidelong glance at the red-cheeked nurses in the park everything gave the impression of activity of preparation pushed to the last degree of haste whatever the prospects of war might be portsmouth was as busy as if war were on though we reached portsmouth at noon it was more than two o'clock before we could secure rooms every hotel was crowded scarcely could we get a word from the busy clerks and at last we were driven to lodgings throwing ourselves on the mercy of a cabman we wandered up and down thoroughly thankful when we obtained some clean decent rooms in a little house in the port sea region somewhat to our surprise our quest proved difficult we drove to the dockyard no admittance without special orders from the admiralty stared us in the face an order made yet more effective by the gruff silence of the sentinels we tried the harbor authorities and the town hall both had been turned into governmental bureaus and both refused admittance on any terms vainly i pleaded my connection with the press that move only increased the suspicious reserve which surrounded us vainly we tried the soothing effect of the golden sovereign we were rebuffed at every turn till forced to temporary inaction we gloomily turned back toward our lodgings there's nothing doing so far as the authorities are concerned remarked tom as we walked along we've got to try some other tack if we could only find somebody here in town who wasn't an official and yet who would know where either of those ships stood none of the dealers in ship stores would know because the german boats would have received their stores at the wharf by jove though here's an idea he brightened up if by any lucky chance they took on fuel here we might get some light on the place from the coal man here's a chemist's shop let's look up in a directory we entered and ran rapidly over the names of dealers in the business directory that was handed us dealer after dealer whose name appeared therein sold goods that belonged with the sea ship chandlery plumbing for yachts and vessels caulkers sailmakers ah here it was fuel supplied to vessels there were some fifteen names on the list i copied them off and turned to the young man behind the counter which of this list i asked would be entirely capable of coaling a large merchantman immediately the clerk ran his eye down the list this and this and this firm he answered briefly pointing at three the office before which we finally stopped looked peculiarly businesslike as we reconnoitred through its broad window hm, looks just like home murmured tom as we gazed at the smart young man in dapper tweeds dictating to a stenographer whose pompadour though like a single tree in a forest had it been on lower broadway yet seemed a rare exotic in this english seaport town the remington machine at one side the brightness of the office furniture and the whole atmosphere in short was a stage picture a sudden revival of the world we had left less than a week ago he is exclaimed tom without the slightest apparent connection see that life insurance calendar on the wall a flaming big-lettered american calendar appeared at the end of his pointing finger may as well play it boldly anyway murmured tom pushing open the door pardon me he said as he entered we're americans and want to know something about coal our dapper friend from behind the desk was on his feet in a moment stepping towards me with outstretched hand mr orrington i'm proud to see you here i looked at him in complete surprise while tom looked on in equal amaze the stenographer sitting behind her keys raised one hand to pat her hair and stared in undisguised and interested wonder i'm afraid you have the advantage of me i remarked he that's not surprising answered the young man with a smile you never saw me before but look here i followed blindly around his desk and waited while he pulled open a drawer at the side exhibit number one he remarked as he took out an american illustrated weekly bearing an imprint of my features it had appeared just after my second signed story came out oh i remarked briefly and lucidly exhibit number two our friend went on bringing to my astonished gaze a file of my own paper whereupon my own story showed their large familiar headlines at the top that's what it is to be famous said a laughing voice over my shoulder now i could travel the world over and never find anybody to recognize me then it's up to me to bring you into the limelight i said recovering this is professor haldane mr thompson at your service supplied the manager from new york sent over here to take charge of this in two years ago likewise a sincere admirer of your work 
now what can i do for you i glanced at the stenographer meaningly say anything you please it will go no further gentlemen let me introduce mrs thompson we rose and bowed we were both in the same office there explained the manager and when they gave me this berth we decided to come together i am over here on business i began still after the man who is trying to stop all war interrupted thompson yes i answered what we want now is to find out just where the kaiser charlemagne or the kaiserine louisa went down if we can find that we shall get divers and go down to the bottom as we could get no news of any of the government offices we thought we would try to find some dealer here who might have supplied either of the boats with coal hit the first time trying said thompson with a smile the kaiser charlemagne took on no liquid here but the kaiserine louisa took a thousand barrels the day before she sunk tom let out a long whistle that's one reason why the kaiserine louisa the alaska and the rest went down without a sound extraordinary that i never thought of that before they all burn hydrocarbons instead of coal and the new hydrocarbon fuels would disappear in the water not a modern warship left today which doesn't burn liquid fuel and most of it's ours said thompson enthusiastically they had to come to it especially when we put out our new boiler attachment by which they could change their furnaces over to use liquids without changing any other part of the machinery tom nodded appreciatively i see he said now as to the main question how can we find out just where the kaiserine louisa went down thompson turned to his wife lulu will you telephone and see if captain mcpherson is at the wharf if he is have them send him here at once a moment's low conversation in the telephone booth and mrs thompson returned he'll come right up she said and turning to her machine was soon pounding away at the keys with a practised hand remarkable woman my wife said thompson swelling with intense pride behind the shelter of his roll-top desk took a medal for speed in an open competition smart as they make em in any deal never lets family relationships stand in the way of business b f t s i call her business from the start he would have gone on but the door opened and a huge grizzled sailor with an officer's cap in his hand lumped in his massive bulk loomed above us for a moment as thompson motioned him to a chair you put the liquid on board the kaiserine louisa the day before she disappeared didn't you asked thompson aye sir came the deep answer from the depths of the captain's chest can you tell us just where she lay the manager went on captain mcpherson stirred uneasily as he looked at us i heard said we were to say naught of that unfortunate ship he rumbled turning half round to regard us with a fixed stare that's all right captain said thompson these gentlemen have been sent here to investigate the matter and you are to tell them all you know the captain evidently felt misgivings but the habit of obeying the orders of his superiors was not lightly to be broken if you go straight out from the castle till the royal yards boy in line with three chimneys to get her on the shore you'll have the spot where she lay when we're longside thank you captain that's all said thompson whereupon captain mcpherson rose and lumbered off as heavily as he had come i've seen the castle i remarked but how on earth can i find the royal george boy and what is that queer thing that said thompson that's where the royal george went down with all on board a hundred and thirty years or so ago now the kaiserine louisa disappears in the same place it's a red boy right off smithsea you can't miss it right said tom so far so good now you haven't a couple of divers in your desk drawer have you thompson laughed sure thing he said at least i can send you to one joe miggs who has done more or less work for us there's the address he said writing it on a card come and see us before you go exultantly we left the office looking back through the window to see our compatriot waving farewell while his wife patting her pompadour with one hand fluttered her handkerchief with the other by dock and arsenal through sounds of clanging furnaces and roar of forges we passed to the street we sought and to the house a house of mark which bore proudly upon its front a life-size picture of a diver completely apparisoned with the words j miggs diver in very small letters below the low dark door gave entrance to a small shop where a man whistling cheerfully was using a small soldering tool on a diver's helmet assisted by a boy clad in a ticking apron the man was j miggs our friend thompson's card brought a sudden stop to the cheerful whistle and it was with a somewhat troubled face that j miggs rose sending his young assistant from the room the boy out he locked both doors to the shop carefully and returned to us mr thompson says that you want a diver 
said Miggs, in a low voice. I'd do anything I could for Mr. Thompson. Minnie's the good job he's got for me, but I can't. I absolutely can't. We've been forbidden to take any jobs at all. Notice was served on every diver in town, and me and my partner can't risk it. What's your regular rate for going down here in the harbor? asked Tom. Two pounds a day, sir, for each of us. Four pounds for the two, if me and my partner work together. I'll give you ten pounds apiece for one night's work, said Tom. The man wavered. I've no money for a fortnight, sir, and I'd like to do it, but I dare not. The officers would put me out of business, and I've got to support my family, Tom persisted. I'll give you ten pounds for your family, and ten pounds more when you go down. J. Meggs took thought, hesitated, wavered, and at length capitulated. I'll do it, sir, he said, if you'll do one thing. If they take my diving rig away, will you agree to pay for our new one? I will, said Tom, and I'll leave the price of it with Mr. Thompson tonight. His last scruples vanished, and J. Miggs was ours. We've got two suits over at Braden Harbor on the Isle of Wight, where we were working. If you tell me your place, we'll meet you tonight where you're staying. Take you across in the motor boat, get the suits, and get back in time to have five or six hours to work, wherever you say. But it must be tonight. Tonight's the last night without a moon. Leaving J. Miggs our address, we went back to our lodgings by way of South Sea Castle and the piers to take a preliminary observation of the boy of the Royal Jarge. We had swallowed a hasty supper, laid in a good store of clothing for the chill of night on the water, and were waiting patiently for the call when there was a knock at the door. As it opened, there entered not J. Miggs, but his small boy helper, whom we had seen earlier. Miggs been jumped he cried breathlessly. He and Joe Hines. The bobby's come and took him an hour ago. He told me when he saw him coming to run, tell you. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Man Who Ended War This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter 9. The engines of the motorboat slowed, gave a final chug, and stopped. Braiding Harbor, remarked our boy guide laconically, as he threw the anchor and stepped to the stern to pull in the skiff that trailed after us. Before us lay the estuary of the Yar, its black water scarcely differentiated in color from the dark shores that rose above it a huddle of buildings lifting on our left changed from blots of blackness into shadowy outlines sprinkled here and there with light as we rode in the lad pulled steadily with but an occasional glance at the shore the steady strokes of the oar slowed down the blackness ahead seemed to rush towards us more swiftly and the boat ran silently up on to the sand i jumped out the little anchor in my hand we were at braiding harbor without a word the boy pulled up the boat dug the flukes of the anchor deep into the sand, and started off into the darkness. "'Come on, Tom,' I said, laughing. "'This is an Arabian night expedition, headed by one of the mutes of Harun al-Rashid. Hustle up, or we'll be left behind.' About three hundred yards from our landing place, our guide suddenly disappeared. We came abruptly on the corner of a small brick building, and rounded it to find him working on the padlock of a broad, low door. "'These here,' remarked the boy, flinging the door open as we came up. We stepped just inside and paused. The scratch of a fusée, the clatter of a lifted lantern, and the low room sprung into light. A weird sight met our eyes. On a shelf, three great diving helmets with shining cyclopean eyes of heavy glass reflected back the lantern's flame and showed barred side windows looking like caged earmuffs. On the shelf below, three pair of huge shoes with leaden soles, seemed ready for some giant's foot, rather than for the use of man. As the light shifted, the armor on the wall came into view, copper breastplate and twilled overalls, hosepipe and coils of safety line, a veritable museum of diving paraphernalia. Tom turned to the boy. You'll have to show us very carefully how to run the safety line in the air pump while you're down. I don't go down, said the boy. Or it's white like. Never go down. Tom and I stared at each other in consternation, with one accord we turned to the boy again who is going down i cried either all you that likes responded the boy calmly 
i'll be the one to go tom i cried i've got to see it with my own eyes to write it up properly why can't we both go exclaimed tom eagerly i don't want to be out of this the boy broke in needs two men up on rope and bump oh pshaw said tom disgustedly i don't see why i shouldn't be in this i tell you what we'll do he went on his face brightening you go down first and then come up and i'll go down after you all right i said it's a go the boy had stood motionless while our discussion had gone on how will you get the stuff down i asked take it on a barrow he replied briefly turning to bring a big wheelbarrow forward take thy two he said pointing to the two helmets on the right and the shoes below them tom and the lad took a helmet and placed it on the barrow i took a pair of shoes and nearly dropped them great scott i ejaculated they weigh a ton twenty pound corrected the lad without a smile you will need it on the bottom we loaded till the boy said stop then took our burden to the skiff carried it out to the boat returned for a second load shipped that locked the door and came down to the shore through the still night we had neither seen nor heard any one during our visit as we started out of braiding harbour tom remarked i'll take the wheel boy i've got the course get the armour on mr orrington never did i experience such a strange toilet the dress of tan twill interlined with sheet rubber and the copper breastplate were clumsy and awkward enough the shoes twenty pounds to each foot were no winged sandals of mercury but the huge helmet was worst of all i seemed to be prisoned in a narrow cell and despite myself i could not wholly keep from wondering what would happen if the air pipe should break or the rope snap the big lens the bull's eye that was the window of the front of the helmet was left open till i went down and i took in the salt air in huge breaths through the orifice expanding my chest to its full capacity while the lad silently plied his wrench on the nuts that clamped the helmet water tight at length the suit was adjusted and the safety line tied securely round my waist then the boy spoke half one down two that's all you need he jerked the rope in my hand once twice and then started forward to take the wheel we had been racing swiftly across towards the lights of portsmouth as i made my diving toilet but my thoughts far swifter had gone thousands of miles more suppose i never came up if i did not would dorothy ever know had i made a mistake in not speaking before unavailing regret tore at me yet stronger than any regret or any weakness was my determination to fulfil my mission here was the next step i must see what lay below the waves as i sat there in my cumbrous raiment i tried to analyse my sensations no danger i had heretofore encountered had ever caused me anything but a pleasing excitement why should this have a disquieting effect upon me when tom was so eager to go the answer came like a flash in lord bacon's words he that hath wife and children hath given hostages to fortune i had neither as yet but my whole heart was set on having them my feeling was not cowardly fear rather it was instinctive regret at taking the chance of going and leaving dorothy behind i breathed easier when i had worked that out and gradually as my mind quieted the uneasiness gave way to a sense of eager expectation the shore lights were growing brighter and tom leaving his place at the bow came down the boat towards my seat in the stern we're almost there old man he remarked jubilantly the lad has the bearings he'll put us over the exact spot and then you can go overboard it's a chance of a lifetime just as he spoke the lad turned bees there he said as he stopped the motor and threw out an anchor the great coil of rope ran swiftly down for a considerable distance and brought the boat up with a jerk the boy came back towards us scroll up to bull's-eye now and start the pump he directed good luck old man said tom wringing my hand as he started up the air pump same to you i go with leaden steps i remarked waving my lead-soled shoe as i spoke tom's hearty laugh was the last thing i heard the bull's eye shut and i found myself breathing fast to my surprise the air supply was ample no trace of taint good wholesome air come i said to myself this is not half bad aided by the boy i clambered clumsily over the bow and went down the little ladder as i entered the water the weight of my suit went from me i was borne up as if i were in swimming but as i sank slowly i began to feel a strange earache increasing in intensity till i thought i should cry out with the agony my forehead above my eyes seemed clamped in a circlet of red-hot iron and the bells of a thousand church spires seemed ringing and reverberating through my head i could see dimly the black water about me 
and I gripped the metal case of the electric lamp that I held in my hand till I feared it would crush into fragments. All of a sudden I touched bottom, and the pain ceased. The relief was so great that for a moment or two I stood motionless, luxuriating in the respite, and as I started to go on I realized that a slight depression was the only unusual bodily feeling left. I turned the switch of my lamp and looked about me. Nothing but clean white sand, nothing to show which way I should turn. Straight ahead is the best course, I decided, and I started forward, my boots and dress heavy and dragging on the surface as they were, of but the slightest inconvenience here. Fortunately for me the tide was no serious hindrance, and I was to windward of the boat. Before moving I turned my lantern in every direction. One thing was sure there was no huge hulking shadow such as a warship lying on the bottom would make my lamp but dimly outlined the lane of light on the sand along which i started forward now that i was about my work and had safely reached the bottom the strangeness of the situation began to wear off i went ahead twenty measured steps casting my light in every direction no result i paced back the same number to keep my position even turned to the right and repeated the maneuver turned to the left and did the same no sign apparently the depths had remained untouched since the Royal George had been cleared from the harbor back at about 1840. Returned from my last trip, I turned off my lantern to save its current, and stood in the darkness, pondering. I did not want to go backward from the place where I was. Such a step would put me to leeward of the boat, and the lad had warned me against such a move, saying that it might be hard for me to make progress against the tide. There was nothing to be done save to try a further cast of fortune. So I pushed on twenty paces forward and started to count twenty more. Just as I was reaching the limit, the lantern gleam showed a shadow ahead of me. I hurried on till the object came into the full light. There, peacefully as if sleeping in his quiet bed at home, lay a midshipman in his blue uniform. He could not have been fifteen years of age. His golden hair, that a mother might often have kissed and caressed, swayed with the slight movement of the waters. His arm lay naturally beneath his head. As I knelt beside this childish victim of a dread mission, a wave of bitter rebellion passed over me. I cried out in very intensity of feeling. The sound reverberating through the helmet to my ears seemed a mighty roar, and, surprised into realization, I braced myself to my work and looked more closely. There was something strange about the uniform, something different from that on the youngsters I had seen about the German harbors. I studied the form before me for a minute, before I saw what it was. At last I placed it. The buttons! The brass buttons were gone! I looked more narrowly. Not a glint of metal showed. Rising, I passed on, and entered on a city of the dead beneath the waves. Officer and sailor, steward and electrician lay in quiet rest. They lay all around me, as if sleeping on a battlefield, ready for the struggle of the morning. I had paced many steps before I reached the end. A thousand men lay there. Not one had even a shadow of surprise, of premonition of death, upon his brow. All lay as if ready for the reveille, the reveille which would not sound for them. It seemed no thing of earth, rather a scene from some unearthly vision where I, a disembodied spirit, walked among the forgotten shells of other souls. I wakened with a start as I came sharp up against a mass which gave way at my approach. I flashed my lamp upon it. A heap of crockery, broken and shattered, met my eye. One plate in ornate gold showed the double eagle and below Kaiserine Luisa. That heap of broken crockery and this city of the dead were all that remained of as fine a battleship, of as magnificent a result of human ingenuity and skill as ever sailed the seas. I must not linger, though I had work enough to do to find all I could of the reasons for the catastrophe and give place to Tom before the dawn could come. Just beside me lay an officer. I could not tell his rank, for all insignia had disappeared. I stooped to look for metal, when suddenly I felt myself rising steadily. I was being drawn to the surface, though I had given no signal. Indignantly, I jerked the rope twice, again and again. The men above paid no heed to my commands, and I mounted steadily upwards. As I rose, the same pains attacked me as when I descended, but the space through which they endured seemed far shorter. In reality, but a brief interval elapsed before I was clambering up the little ladder to find myself in the full glare of a powerful searchlight, while the boat started off at full speed. I had no time to look around till the boy helped me to loosen the bull's-eye in the front of my helmet. Then I surveyed the scene. 
the boat was going at her top speed while tom ran her straight out toward the isle of wight the searchlight of a warship a mile or more away was playing constantly on us as we sped along and i could see a spot of darkness probably a launch leaving her side and starting in our direction as i gazed i breathed in long breaths of fresh air i felt as if i had never known how good air just plain air was before the searchlight of a warship was playing constantly on us take off mr orrington's armor boy ordered tom sharply you all right jim sure i answered what are we in for i don't know yet replied tom but we'll know pretty soon we can't get away in this old boat we'll run as long as we can though luckily they sent a launch not a torpedo boat or a destroyer the battleship landed us with their searchlight just a few minutes ago and once they fixed it on us i pulled you up get anything yes i replied and fell back into silence while the lad valeted me out of my diving suit the launch was coming swiftly it seemed to be moving two feet to our one it's going to be a pretty close shave i remarked as i stood beside tom who had given the wheel to the boy yes but i'm going to head straight for ryder and trust to luck we were well towards the shore of the isle as the launch came near enough to hail stop or we shoot came hurtling at us no go said tom resignedly as he stopped the engine and there's the shore not five hundred yards away just as he spoke the light vanished the searchlight had gone out something must have happened to the current we could hear the officer swear vigorously as the launch came up tom seized my arm to the dinghy he whispered lad if you keep your mouth shut i'll straighten everything out he murmured to the boy as we scrambled to the stern right sir said the boy briefly as he sat phlegmatically beside the engine tumbling into the dinghy i seized the oars and pulled swiftly towards the shore as the launch came up on the opposite side we could hear the hail as the officer came aboard and his angry raging where are the other men don't know answered the boy the officer ran to the stern they have a boat follow them he cried but just as the launch turned we struck the shore and before the panting sailors could reach us we were off the beach and sheltered in a deep doorway we heard their steps running by as we stood crouched against the wall but we dared not venture out till we had heard them returning after a futile chase once they were by we started off into the country at a brisk pace the morning was well on as we came into seaview whence we had planned to come back to portsmouth i had finished my story and tom had meditated on it for an hour while we strode sturdily on as we stopped by a wayside brook to freshen our toilette he spoke no metal not a bit i answered dorothy was right said tom the man who was trying to stop all war must have some terrific power which utterly destroys metal causing it to change completely into some other form and instantly disappear how horrible to have that man at large jim we've got to find him that little middy you told me of would fire my purpose ten times over if it were not ablaze already there's one thing though do you suppose the british government knows what we know i have very little doubt they do i answered i fully believe that somebody had been there before us everything points that way the closing of all diving operations by the authorities the chase of our boat and their persistent effort to capture us you must be right jim said tom soberly they wouldn't want anyone to know any more about conditions than they could help you can't tell what little thing will start the fire of war just now i guess we'd better keep this to ourselves for the present right you are i answered as we walked in to see view we reached our rooms without the slightest difficulty and went to bed after a hearty breakfast we were awakened about twelve by a knock at the door and the call of a familiar voice it was our friend thompson the manager he closed the door carefully as i admitted him then he turned and shook hands with me mr orrington he said you're a great man and a lucky one j miggs and his boy came to see me this morning oh then they didn't keep them i cried no said thompson laughing j miggs got out of prison and his boy never got there the lad waked up for once the launch with all its crew went chasing you and by the time they got back the youngster was safe at the dock at portsmouth and the suits were stored you'd better not see either of them though they may be watched if you'll give me the money i'll pay him and it will be all right i paid the money and we parted the moment thompson closed the door i rushed into tom's room get up i said energetically j miggs and his boy are both free i've left the money for them and it's time now for us to get out immediately this town is none too healthy a location for us now that business is out of the way tom's loquaciousness had a habit of utterly disappearing when a new scientific conception entered his head as we drove to the station he stopped the cab at a bookseller's dashed in and returned with a package of books and papers 
once settled in the train don't speak to me till i get through if you don't mind he said i've got something here i want to work out he opened his new package spread the books on the seat and took up a block and his fountain pen i scanned the title of his books casually new insulators for high currents control and insulation of radioactive apparatus yacht construction theory of woodworking kaima what it has done for electricity types of sailing vessels for the past twenty years queer mixture i said to myself idly and then turned my attention to the scenery tom was busy with his pocket rule measuring and laying off diagrams for three hours until the outer edges of london began to appear looking up suddenly he spoke almost in aren't we well i'll put my work away and we'll discuss our future plans for a few minutes as we rolled into waterloo station our discussion ended we'll go down somewhere on the channel said tom set up the wave measuring machine and see what we can do with that it's our best card and we'll work there till dorothy comes we've got to hang around here till she arrives anyway we certainly have said i and my heart leapt exultantly at the thought of her coming end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of The Man Who Ended War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter Ten. Once more, I sought the booking office at Euston. The express has left Prince's stage at Liverpool, sir. Will be here in about three hours now, sir. Was the response to my question. I turned away, dismissed my cab, and started out through the great pillars of the entrance. Three hours more, and Dorothy would be here. Tom and I, with the wave-measuring machine, had taken the first boat, which happily left the evening after our interview with Ordway. Dorothy, following a week later, had arrived at Liverpool and was speeding to London. It had been hard to wait the week, filled as it had been with work, but it seemed as if these last hours would never go. Three hours to wait! i had paced the platform of euston for two already and i walked out now towards bloomsbury passing slowly through its pleasant squares and watching the foliage behind their guarding railings before i knew it i was in front of the british museum and i glanced at my watch as good a place to wait as any i said to myself and i crossed the courtyard and started up the steps just then a man hurrying out slipped at the top of the stone steps and fell heavily striking his head and lying unconscious where he fell as it chanced i was the only spectator save for a single policeman and as i hurried forward i noticed a theta sigma rho fraternity pin on the waistcoat of the fallen man i reached him first the policeman coming up a second later and together we raised the unconscious form and carried the man to an office where we placed him on a lounge i read the name on the reverse of his pin e s hammerley as he lay there breathing heavily i watched him with that interest which a fellow countryman and far more than that a member of one's own fraternity in distress in a foreign land inspires he was a clean-cut young fellow neatly but very simply clad and i noticed a red acid stain on his sleeve i had time for no more for the doctor came hurrying in only a scalp wound he said as he made his brief examination i can bring him round in a minute a vigorous application of cold water an aromatic to his nose and the patient sneezed and opened his eyes as he gazed around, I stepped forward. "'Mr. Hammerley,' I said, "'I'm Orrington of Columbia. I'm a Theta Sigma Rho man myself, as I see you are. You've had a nasty fall, but you're coming out all right. I'm going to see you home.' Hammerley smiled rather wanly. "'I don't feel very energetic,' he said. "'I'd be mighty glad to have you. I'm in lodgings, up on Half Moon Street.' The doctor broke in. "'That's enough talking for the present. Let me fix up your head, and you can go all right.' while the doctor bandaged hammerley's head i signalled a hansom and in a few minutes we were speeding off to half moon street too much shaken up by his fall for conversation hammerley lay back against the cushions till we reached his lodgings but he arrived there without seeming any worse for the trip i saw him safely to bed promised him an early visit and left a call for a nearby doctor then i looked at my watch barely time to reach dorothy's train to euston rush i cried to the cabby and away we sped just as the train came puffing in i reached the platform and there was dorothy's dear head leaning from the window of her car the black old station was transformed as she stepped lightly to the platform followed by her maid she came towards me with both hands outstretched oh jim it's good to see you where's tom 
down at Folkestone, I answered. We'll join him there as soon as you've had a night's sleep. Why wait for that? asked Dorothy energetically. It's only twelve now. We can run down there after lunch. Where are our rooms? At the Savoy, I said. Suppose you send your maid up there with the luggage, and we go up in a hansom. It took scarcely ten minutes to load the maid and the luggage in a four-wheeler and join Dorothy. As we swung out through the gates, she spoke with a long breath. It seems good to be back in London again, even with war so near and with so much ahead of us. Now, tell me everything that's happened since you came over to London from Portsmouth. I got your letter at Queenstown telling about your experiences on the bottom of the sea. How I wish I could have been there. But never mind that now. Tell me all you've done in the last four days. I settled down to my task. Tom and I came over safely, as you already know, from our wire at Queenstown. We decided that the man would be working in the channel, and after some discussion, settled on Folkestone as the base from which to work the wave-measuring machine. We took the apparatus down there three days ago, got a big room, and set it up. I chartered a yacht. What did you do that for? interrupted Dorothy. So we could run down the man if he was on the sea. We decided coming over that he was more likely to do his experimenting on water than on land and Tom thinks he can get him from his experimental waves. I see, said Dorothy. Go ahead. After chartering the yacht, I helped Tom all I could till last night, when I came up to London to meet you. Tom expects to get the machine set up today. That's about all. How is the war progressing? asked Dorothy. Everybody on board the liner was greatly afraid it would begin before we got across, and that we might be captured. But we reached Liverpool all right. Nothing's happened yet, I answered, but I think it's coming, may come any minute. They say that the Emperor has refused to see visitors since the Kaiserin Luisa went down, and I think the government expects war immediately. They're mobilizing rapidly on both sides. Then there certainly isn't a minute to lose in reaching Folkestone, said Dorothy decisively. We'll just stop for lunch and go right down. It was a day of wonders. Since the night when we had searched for Joslyn, Dorothy and I had never been alone together. The ride from the station to the Savoy was a glorified pilgrimage. The lunch, as we sat looking out on the embankment, bathed in sunshine, was a celestial repast. Even the time of waiting in the hotel for Dorothy to condense her luggage and make ready for the coming trip was a delight. But best of all was the trip down to Folkestone. The guard smiled widely at the golden sovereign which saved the compartment for us, and the porter heaped attentions on us for his tip but the value which they purchased was priceless. Two hours of speeding through the lovely English country in a tete-a-tete -tete with my lady. All too soon came Folkestone, and there beside the train was Tom. I've got him, he whispered excitedly. Hurry up. It's just time to take another reading. As we bowled along through the old streets, Tom hurriedly told us of his experience. He's experimenting constantly now, he said. He sent off some waves yesterday afternoon about four o'clock, just after I got the apparatus going. Sent off some more about ten, and some this morning, a little after nine. They're all from some place out in the channel, over towards the French coast. They're from practically the same spot. So I got everything ready for an instant departure on our little boat. And the moment we hear from him again, we'll start straight for him. Dorothy's eyes sparkled with excitement. I'm so glad I got here. I wouldn't miss the inn for anything. But you're not going with us on the yacht, I said anxiously. Of course she's not said tom gruffly well i am said dorothy and that's all there is about it tom and i broke out in a jumble of incoherent objections which dorothy met with smiling assurance you think the man may be desperate if we find him she said well i don't for a minute believe he will be he's doing too big a thing to have anything against ordinary people and if something did happen you'd need me to protect you ten minutes more of the drive brought ten minutes more of heated discussion but it brought us no victory, and the end of the debate came when Tom gave in with the brotherly remark, "'Well, go your own confounded obstinate way, then,' to which Dorothy, as calm and smiling as a summer morn, responded simply, "'I shall.' "'Here's our place,' said Tom, as we rattled up to a house which displayed on the stairs to the second story a sign, "'Dancing Academy.' This was the only room we could get that had incandescent wiring, and that was long enough to hold the scale of the Denkel apparatus." he explained to Dorothy, as we crossed the bare floor to the apparatus, standing in front of the chairs whereon was wont to repose the beauty and chivalry of Folkestone at the assemblies, advertised below. The machine is working beautifully. Look at this. He threw the switch, lighted the lamp, and lowered the green shade. The belt of metal had revolved scarcely a minute, and Tom was pulling down the last shade as the beam fluttered and the machine stopped. Just in time, 
said dorothy delighted hurry up tom the old inherent passion of the chase was on us all and in less than twenty minutes the last figures made tom and dorothy compared their work just there said tom making a cross with his pencil on a point on the french coast some ten miles up from boulogne come on don't waste a minute it's practically a straight run across the channel ten minutes brought us aboard the little yacht and ten minutes more saw us steaming out of the harbor dorothy was with us further discussion had been useless hm, not much like the black arrow i said as we came out rather slowly into the channel you wait till she gets speeded up said tom she can go i proved that yesterday he was right once out into the channel our speed gradually increased till we were making good progress in an hour we sighted the french coast from the little bridge and tom beside the skipper was making for the cross on the chart we'll sight her if she hasn't gone directly away from us inside of fifteen minutes tom said dorothy stood beside the wheel ranging the whole horizon with her binoculars she had thrown aside her hat and a loosened tress of her hair flew lightly across my face as i stood beside her two sails off that point she announced in a few moments they look more like those tubs of french fish boats than a yacht she said shortly look at them jim she handed her glasses to me the horizon for five miles in any direction from the point where we were heading showed but the two sails she had mentioned and we headed directly for them as we neared them we saw that dorothy's eyes had proved true there were wide clumsy fishing craft such as sail from the harbour of bologna or hang in a miniature as votive offerings before the altars of the cathedral undecked and open they could hold no complicated apparatus their crews were sturdy jerseyed fishermen who stared in open-mouthed wonder as our yacht came up alongside the first and a volley of questions came in rapid french from the beautiful girl on the bridge with instinctive courtesy every sailor on either boat removed his cap as she spoke and the skipper gave answer in slow deeply considered words no we have seen no yacht except our own hein is it not so he turned to the sailors a chorus of affirmatives came back there had been no other vessel off this point save the virginie of their own town an expressive thumb pointed to the other boat for four or five hours they would surely have seen it if there had been tom consulted his chart and consulted our own skipper it was the very spot with knitted brow he ordered the boat headed for the other fishermen i pulled a half sovereign from my pocket bouvet à mecqua mes garçons a chorus of mercies followed our path the other boat gave no better results its sailors had seen nothing and we ran back to the point whence the ways had come for a brief consultation as we gazed on the quiet water just tinged with the last of the sunset i spoke there's only one explanation if the wave measuring machine is correct he's down on the bottom in a submarine or he was there when he sent off those waves i'm afraid that's right jim said tom if i could only see down there i wonder how deep it is he called to the captain take a sounding here will you please we hurried forward and watched the line overboard fathom after fathom disappeared up to the very end it's more than a hundred twenty fathoms sir reported the captain no use then said tom go right back to folkestone we'll have a couple more tries to-morrow he went on but frankly i'm afraid it won't do any good to find a submarine in these waters would be worse than finding a needle in a haystack it was a rather gloomy little party that landed at folkestone that night we had seemed so near success yet there was one alleviation i had dreaded bringing dorothy into danger and i had had a most uneasy feeling as to the possible result of the meeting with a man inspired with so fixed and fearful a purpose as he whom we sought much as i desired the completion of my search i could not therefore feel too complete a sense of regret at the two failures which we encountered on the channel the next day the man was in the channel sea he was experimenting with this apparatus daily under its waves we could be sure of that but he could not be reached so we finally gave in and returned to london all the way up in the train dorothy sat in deep thought but no result came from her meditations and we returned to the savoy without a ray of light as to our next move the next morning i woke with fresh courage we had gained so much and so unexpectedly that i felt convinced we must gain more i found a table in the dining-room and waited there for tom and dorothy who shortly appeared we breakfasted gaily the morning sun shone brightly on the little park below the window and on the thames flowing slowly beyond the peaceful scene looked little like war but the papers before us were full of dire forebodings the german emperor still sulked movements of army corps and of battleships were the main part of their story 
despite the columns filled with martial things every newspaper had at least one reference to the man who was trying to stop all war and in more than one of them was a word as to the double danger of the fleets who faced not only a foreign foe but annihilation at the hands of this unseen destroyer as we finished breakfast dorothy asked what are you boys going to do this morning i must go down to the city to get some money i replied i think i'll do the same remarked tom we'll all go together then said dorothy as we passed out into the courtyard i raised my stick for a cab but dorothy stopped me let's go down on top of a bus i haven't been on one since i landed and we're in no hurry up the winding stair we climbed and tom and dorothy found a seat beside the driver while i was just behind down the strand and into fleet street we passed through the crowds before the bulletins watching anxiously for the message which should spell war at the top of ludgate hill just by st paul's came a block one of those hopeless tangles which so completely ties up london traffic another bus stood just ahead and i read off the big advertisements which lined its top alhambra radium ballet i read there's a scientific scheme for you what is a radium ballet anyway oh they cover the girls dresses with phosphorescent paint and turn out the lights said tom it's an old idea they had them ten years ago dorothy turned suddenly that's what we want it's the very thing we've been hunting for the new clue we've never run that down at all tom and i followed slowly her quick intuition what new clue i asked the phosphorescent paint clue answered dorothy energetically the man wrote his first message with a peculiar type of phosphorescent ink he must have been working with it for some time if we can only find anybody that knows about that kind of paint we might find out something more definite about him it's the best clue we have anyway but how will you get a hold of the people who know about phosphorescent paint said tom i think you're in the blindest alley yet End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of The Man Who Ended War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter Eleven. As the horses started up, Dorothy refuted Tom's statement indignantly. It isn't a blind alley, it's a good clue we've run down practically every other line and now we may as well try this everything points to the belief that the man is a scientist of no slight ability whether he or someone else discovered his high-power radioactive force he must be a good man or he wouldn't be able to use it now it seems probable to me that he was working with phosphorescent ink simply because it was the nearest at hand a man engaged in research like that would be likely to have at least one assistant i propose to find that assistant i'd like to see you do it said tom doubtingly how would you go to work i'd advertise said dorothy advertise remarked tom here's the way to do it wanted the assistant of the man who was trying to stop all war of course not stupid said dorothy impatiently we'll advertise for a man who has some experience in making phosphorescent ink that's the line to work on don't you see that since phosphorescent paint acts best with such energy as is given by radioactive substances that he's likely to have been using it there's such a close relation between phosphorescence and radioactivity that a man might be working with both but where will you advertise i said how can you tell where the man is work how can you tell his nationality i think he's an american but no one can tell if you mean dick regnier exclaimed dorothy her eyes flashing you're wrong i've known him for years and i know he is not the man it takes just a touch of insanity that dick never had to do what the man is doing the man must be practically a monomaniac on the subject the bus stopped just as the bank came in sight dorothy turned squarely in her seat and faced me the seats around us happened to be empty she looked at my somewhat guilty face and spoke emphatically jim orrington you don't believe me but it isn't dick regnier now dorothy i said look here how did that letter get changed unless it was done by regnier that night at your cousin's i don't know she answered oh come now said tom drop it here's where we get off we had drawn our money and started away when i suddenly thought of the mail 
i turned back to the little window and asked if there were any letters for us which had not been forwarded a few moments brought a big package among them three or four bulky envelopes from the office hailing a cab we read busily as we drove back to the savoy one long typewritten report i read with especial care and handed over to dorothy when she had finished her mail she looked at me reproachfully as she read the title and you never mentioned this at all i forgot all about it i answered i started that inquiry the day i was in prison the night i got out the dinkel letter came and we've been so busy ever since that i completely forgot this let's hear it said tom just read the condensed paragraph at the top that tells the whole story you can read the rest at your leisure dorothy began in her clear voice report on mr richard regnier richard regnier is the son of the late colonel arthur regnier of savannah georgia he was educated at private schools and at princeton his residence is savannah but he has spent much time in england he specialized in chemistry when in college and published one paper after graduation on some rare chemical compounds he has no regular occupation has an independent income and spends most of his time in various philanthropic works is a member of several organizations such as the peace society the tuberculosis league etc and of four clubs complete details given below every effort has been made to obtain his present address but not even his bankers know it the only fact concerning this which could be obtained was that he sailed for europe on the hamburg american line the last of june this present year for details of this part of the investigation see below well he didn't do it he isn't doing it said dorothy emphatically he's got the training for it said tom reflectively i am sure began dorothy but i broke in what's the use of discussing it now we can't get a hold of regnier anyway and your phosphorescent ink scheme seems the next scheme to try here we are at the temple let's go to one of my friends who is a solicitor here and see if we can use his office as headquarters to see the applicants so the discussion ended a brief interview with my friend and a short debate on the best method of procedure brought us to certain conclusions it was really just as possible that the man had worked in london as anywhere else and we decided to advertise in six of the morning papers for three days asking for a man who had had some experience with phosphorescent inks and who was capable of assisting in a scientific examination with regard to them applicants were to meet at the office of my friend in the middle temple at three o'clock on the afternoon of the third day for two days and a half i spent my time watching the preparations for war and urging forward the search for regnier he had completely dropped out of sight no information of his whereabouts could be obtained and when we met at the temple on the afternoon of the third day we were no further ahead at three o'clock the waiting-room of the office was full and a long line of men extended down the stairs the crowd bore striking witness to the horde of unemployed seeking for even the slightest chance of employment my friend's clerks were in despair but somehow they managed to evolve something like order from the mass and one by one the applicants were admitted after the first half-dozen we saw that they could be divided into three classes the men who knew nothing about science and nothing about any kind of ink the men who knew something about ink but nothing about phosphorescent ink and the men who had been laboratory assistants to various research followers we divided them rapidly on this basis and in an hour had dismissed all the members of classes one and two there were left some ten others who had been assistants in research laboratories one by one we examined these they had worked in various lines the first five in chemical researches the last five in various physical and engineering lines try as we might we could get no information from any of them with regard to phosphorescent ink or with regard to any unusual work with radioactive energy the last man had been dismissed and we had sat down to afternoon tea with my friend when we heard words in the outer office the door opened and a clerk entered there's one more man sir he said i told him he was too late but he's quite insistent sir will you care to see him surely i said and we all went out into the outer office a tall bent man with drooping moustache stood by the window his gaunt face and threadbare clothes neatly brushed though they were showed an evident lack of prosperity i ventured to insist sir he said addressing me 
as I have had quite a little experience in phosphorescent ink. It was only a year ago that I served in a laboratory where they were working with it, and while I was simply working under the direction of other people, I think I could work well along that line. I should try to do my best. I need a place. This looked more like the real thing. I waved towards Tom. He could run this end of the inquiry better than I. What's your name? George Swinton. Where did you have your experience? questioned Tom. With Dr. Hyded Mueller in his private research laboratory, answered the man. What training have you had? Not much. Only a few courses at the University of London. I was only the second assistant. I worked with Dr. Hyden Mueller for four years until he died six months ago. I have had no place since, sir. Did your employer do anything with radioactive work? Yes, sir. He died that way. He was killed. Paralyzed, you might say, while working with something in a locked room. He always did that work in a locked room. "'What were the circumstances of his death?' asked Tom. The man hesitated and looked up somewhat fearfully. "'I don't see what that has to do with phosphorescent ink,' he said. "'The police went all into the matter of his death, and they said it was just death by paralysis.' He stopped and shut his mouth hard. Dorothy broke in. "'Mr. Swinton, here is the state of affairs. I don't think my brother has made it quite plain.' we are more interested in dr heidenmuller's radioactive work than in his phosphorescent paint we have no question of you at all we do not want to know anything which is not entirely right for us to know but we do want to know all you feel you can rightly tell us of his work i feel sure that my brother will be ready to employ you if you can show that you have done this and that you can do what he wants the man's face cleared dorothy's words were more convincing than evidence he reached into his pockets and drew forth a bunch of papers which he gave to tom who rapidly ran through them they're all right he said handing them back now if i give you twenty pounds a month for two months will that be all right a dull red rose in the man's face as his eyes lighted it will mean everything to me sir he said i've got a wife and a boy tom drew out his purse here's ten pounds to clinch the bargain and he handed him two five-pound notes i appreciate that more than i can say said the man the tears welling up in his eyes with emotion now what did you want to know first about dr heidenmuller's apparatus and then about his death i'm afraid i can't tell you much of the apparatus i never even saw it it was in an inner room to which the doctor had the only key i never was in the room till the day we broke down the door and took him out dead there was no apparatus there then it must have been removed how did the room look asked dorothy it was all bare nothing in it at all except a wooden chair where he sat and a wooden table how about the walls and ceiling they were all of wood how about the locks on the door and the windows that was a funny thing they were of wood too though he had an iron key what did the doctor have in his pockets four five-pound notes no change and his watch was gone there was nothing in his watch pocket except a watch crystal his keys were gone too and only the ribbon of his watch was left lying on the floor what did the doctor say about his death straight paralysis they said i had been away for three days he was around the laboratory for one day after i left and the day after that he must have died they said death was instantaneous did the doctor leave any family none what became of his papers nobody knows he had scarcely any friends his property went to a niece in germany and she came over to hunt for papers but she found none what became of the other assistant he went back to germany he knew nothing more than i did however did the doctor have any friends who came to see him very few there was one american who came to see him now and then i never knew his name or where he came from nor did i know the name of the two or three german friends he had 
"'Anything else you can think of?' asked Tom. "'Nothing else, I'm afraid,' answered Swinton. Tom rose from his chair and paced up and down the room, his hands in his trouser pockets, his coat flung back. As he walked, Swinton, watching him, uttered an exclamation. "'I can tell you one thing about the American,' he said. "'He wore a peculiar-shaped pin on his waistcoat, such as you wear on your fob.' Tom pulled up his fob with its Theta Sigma row pin. "'There's a good clue anyway,' he said. "'He must be a Theta Sigma row man.' We could get nothing more from Swinton, and after directing him to call at the Savoy the next morning, we sent him away happy. As we came down the narrow stairs and out of the old arched passages of the temple, Dorothy said, "'Let's walk up the embankment to the hotel. We can think better that way.' We had gone half the distance when she stopped. "'Suppose we talk it over here.' and we stopped beside the parapet to discuss the matter. "'As I make it out,' said Tom, "'Heidenmuller was the man who discovered the secret power which has been destroying the battleships, but he can't be the man because he died before the first ship went down. Therefore he must have passed it on to someone else who was using it, possibly the American who was his friend, or one of the Germans. It strikes me that the next thing to do is to find an American in London who wears a Theta Sigma Rho pin.' instantly i startled the peaceful calm of the embankment and made myself an object of suspicion to the neighbouring bobby by leaping up in the air and clapping my hands together hammerly by all that's holy i cried you remember that fellow i took home that night you arrived dorothy she nodded her eyes gleaming with interest he's one of our men he had an acid stain on his coat i'll wager you he's the american i know where he lives and i've been up to see him once but he was out "'I'll go up there right after dinner.' "'Do you think he's the man?' asked Tom in excitement. "'I don't see how he could be,' I said slowly. "'The man was working in the channel when he was in the British Museum, "'but he's surely the next man to interview.' "'By eight, I was in a hansom, speeding towards Half Moon Street. "'Was Mr. Hammerly in?' "'He was, and met me halfway down the stairs. "'Oh, this is very good of you, Orrington,' he said. I was very sorry to miss your last call. For some time we talked of various things, of college days and of affairs at home. He had come over as a Rhodes Scholar, having little money left him while at Oxford, had gone on in London after graduation, leading a life of quiet study. As we talked, I sized my companion up. A trifle grave, but after all a sane, sterling fellow, I decided, and I put my errand directly to him. You knew Dr. Heidenmuller? I said abruptly yes poor old chap he said calmly how did you happen to run across him i didn't know him personally i said but i knew a man who did know him one of our own men tom haldane of columbia who was very greatly interested in the radioactive work which dr heidenmuller was carrying on before his death is here with me hammerly's face filled with eagerness his whole attitude changed did haldane know what he was doing he asked breathlessly not exactly i said well if he knows anything about it i believe he knows one of the greatest things in modern science the doctor never told me anything about it but i went into that room the day he was taken out dead and ever since that time i felt that he had found a force greater than anything he had obtained and that force killed him he paused i've never said anything to anybody else but haldane is a man of all others to know it and you might tell him that from me he may be able to use it somehow i can't I tried my best to get hold of some clue concerning it after Heidenmuller's death, but it was absolutely useless. Do you think that Haldane has enough data to work it out? Frankly, I don't know, I said. Except for two things, I should have said the secret died with him, said Hammerly slowly. I bent forward, hanging on every word. I've never spoken of either, but... He paused. You know, this man who is trying to stop all war? I nodded. Well... From the way Heidenmuller's room looked and the way the things in his pockets were left, I've wondered if the man had not his secrets. Do you know, he said, leaning forward, there were no eyelets in his shoes when he was found. The crimps were in the leather of the strings, but the metal ends were gone. The lenses of his spectacles, without any mounting, were lying on the floor. The very filling of his teeth had gone. Why couldn't a battleship disappear into its elemental parts the same way, all its living contents paralyzed by the shock, dying instantly and sinking below the waves? I've wondered more than once if the government sent down divers in Portsmouth Harbor, and if they did what they found. 
there was just one thing to do he held as much as we did of the secret perhaps he knew more from beginning to end i told the whole story of our search as i went on he grew more and more excited as i paused toward the end he broke in the second thing fits in here the reason why i believe the secret might not be lost one day as i went into the laboratory the doctor's assistant told me that he was in the inner room but had left word for me to wait i was extremely curious for no one had ever entered that inner room to my knowledge the door opened at last and a tall dark man an american i should say came out of that closed room with the doctor i never saw him before or since now is he the man who got the secret and with it is he trying to stop all war i was out of my seat with excitement i believe he is would you know him if you saw his photograph surely said hammerly i rose to go hold on exclaimed hammerly i haven't told you half yet go on i said eagerly seating myself once more that first day after i had made a rough examination i started to go over the inner room inch by inch at first i thought it was perfectly insulated by wood there wasn't a piece of metal nor even a piece of glass in it where the incandescent light came down hung a bit of twisted cord without a scrap of metal remaining there was a length of insulating cloth minus the wire it covered lying on the floor i went round and round hunting for metal but i could find none there was a wooden shutter over the window and no glass i closed the door and walked over every inch of the room trying to find any break whatsoever in the insulation the only thing i could find was a faint glimmer where the wooden window shutter did not quite join i went outside and studied the place from the street there was no appearance of anything unusual on the wall of the laboratory excepting that the boarded window of the wooden room looked out like a rectangular unseen eye i crossed to the sidewalk just before the laboratory and looked up and down the opposite wall there was nothing unusual on that side save two square places side by side on the painted wall which looked fresher than the wall around i examined them more carefully crossed and recrossed the two spots were almost exactly opposite the lower end of the shuttered window where i had seen a slight chink of light the only place where the insulation of wood was broken i went up the stairs of the house opposite it was a little tea shop a wooden sign leaned against the wall beside the door i picked it up the screw holes and the whiter paint where the hinges had lain showed clear but there was no metal about it the proprietress bustled up to take my order and as she saw me looking at the sign broke into voluble explanation i should have put the sign back in its place sir but fairly didn't dare to it was a week come tuesday when it fell it's god's own mercy there wasn't somebody killed sir and the strangest thing too i couldn't find sight nor smell of the hinges and the rod where it hung it must have pulled out of the wall and somebody have picked up the iron before i could get down sir now isn't that strange sir it had fallen the day that heidenmuller died i went back into the laboratory and hunted over every square inch of it but i found nothing i stood there puzzling if there had been some power that had killed heidenmuller there must have been some material substance in which it was kept i had made the most careful inquiries about the things on his person and in the room no one could tell me anything swenton and gregan the two assistants were neither of them there but the first one who entered the room when the doctor's body was found was a sharp-faced lad who acted as janitor i had questioned him thoroughly as i thought but i resolved to see if he did not know more i went to him again and a lucky inspiration came to me holding the sovereign in my hand i remarked casually if there is any little personal memento of the doctor left i should like very much to have it the narrow eyes of the lad gleamed he thrust his hand into his pocket and drew out what was apparently a leather cigarette case snatched the sovereign and handed me the case found it on the floor after he took him out he mumbled his a only thing was there Hamerly rose as he spoke and walked to his desk i followed my heart pulsating with great leaps he took from a drawer what seemed to be a pigskin cigarette case cut in half Hamerly held the two sections out in his hand at the top was a queerly constructed valve the case was lined with a black substance that looked like rubber i believe said hammerly gravely that in this case there was some terrifically powerful substance which killed heidenmuller and destroyed all the metal in the wooden room by escaping through the accidentally open valve i believe the man who is trying to stop all war uses the same dread agent i believe once the substance escapes and does its work that it turns into a harmless gas as hydrogen 
once it has been exploded with oxygen forms harmless water or as the carbon of coal which has blazed when united with the oxygen of the air becomes after that union inert carbon dioxide you know now all i know i've done all i could with it he ended take it to haldane dazed with the story i could only thank him and take the case we parted with a word of goodwill and assurance of secrecy on his side end of chapter eleven